I'm Greg Grandy, unpacking the Enviro tackle box at my favorite fishing hole. I can come here anytime I want because this place is considered a commons. Anyone who wants to use it can because it's considered something that can be shared by all. For some reason, the fish are onto me. They've packed it off to somewhere else out there where I'm not. This concept known as a commons is something to be explored. There are examples all around you. The fish here, for instance, are a commons. They are a resource that's available so that anyone with the proper skills, techniques, license, and maybe a little luck can catch them. Even water can be a common resource. Water can be used for things like water skiing, yachting, or as an enjoyable part of the beach. There are many places where the water can be used by everyone. That's an example of a common. But ask yourself, who owns the moon? The stars? The air you breathe? The open range where the buffalo roam? Does one person own the national parks and the wildlife in them? No, they're a commons for a whole nation. This is the commons area of Old Sturbridge Village, a recreation of a rural New England community of the 1830s. New England towns, uh, when they were first laid out, often included in the plan common land, land that was held in common by all the people. The commons in the middle of these towns were owned by the town itself, which meant they were owned by the people. And so people felt the, the right to be able to use them for, for recreation and for things like grazing animals, but playing games upon and um, for public gatherings. Commons became increasingly attractive pieces of real estate for people to build their houses along and their businesses near. Because they're often in the geographic center of towns and at crossroads, there it's a good place to set up stores, to set up businesses, things like churches, banks, and other establishments. Of course, as with any land held in common, some people abuse that right. And it's very easy for sheep and cattle to overgraze a common, for people to cut too many trees. And some people abused the, the, those common rights and took too much personal gain off public land. Historically, then, overuse of shared resources has been a problem. Like our ancestors, we are now faced with important decisions about how to best use and conserve our commons. How will we respond? In Louisiana, we have 15 baby market lambs right now, which range from about um, three months old to about four and a half months old. In Oklahoma, we have about 60 ewes, which are used for breeding to um, produce these market lambs, which you see here. And they're on about 160 acres. When we first moved here to Louisiana, we brought about 45 ewes um, from our flock here, and we put them on about 15 acres of land, which we discovered which is, was a big mistake. In Oklahoma, the carrying capacity of the land for sheep is about two ewes for two acres. In Louisiana, however, it's a little different because of the low protein in the grass and high humidity and the parasite problem. It's one U for three acres. In Louisiana, we had a real problem keeping our sheep in healthy conditions because they overgrazed the hemp land. We had too many um, head per acre um, eating the grass off of the land. Sheep are a whole lot um, harder on the land than cattle are because they, they will eat the grass all the way to the roots all the way to the dirt. We didn't have a setup to where we could switch our ewes from pasture to pasture. And so our grass would get too short, too close to the ground level, and we had a problem with parasites. And parasites come in due to overgrazing and because the ground temperature here doesn't get cold enough to kill out the parasites like it does in Oklahoma. So we just had a real problem with it. So we had to take them back to Oklahoma. So that's why we have sheep in two different states. <laughs> When sheep overgraze the land, it can take up to a year for the grass to grow back. That's why families like the Jenkins rotate their sheep to different fields. This helps prevent overgrazing, which is a form of resource depletion. Let's look at another example of carrying capacity. Say, a fish pond. Let's say the pond has 100 fish. If 100 fish eat all the available food, then the number of fish has exceeded the carrying capacity. Maybe 60 fish would have been the pond's carrying capacity. 
Now, let's look at the pond's sustainability as a fishing spot. How many fishermen can this pond sustain? Let's try 10. If 10 fishermen catch all the fish in the pond, it is beyond the sustainability for fishing. In fact, it has reached the point of resource depletion. That means that there are no longer fish in the pond. The fish, as a resource, are gone. If the fishermen who come here leave enough fish to regenerate, that means the pond has sustainability as a fishing hole. There is a problem, though, if some of us get greedy with the commons and threaten sustainability. This is Cape Cod, Massachusetts, a place named for its once abundant codfish resources. It's been fished for hundreds of years, but now cod and many other popular fish species have been overfished. Did other factors lead to the fish disappearing? And how can this tragedy of the fish commons be solved? 150 years ago, people say that the codfish were so thick you could walk across them. And obviously today, that's not the case anymore. We've seen the whole uh, complex of uh, what we call the ground fish, the fish that hug the bottom. And that includes things like flounders, haddock, hakes, and other species. They kind of went down together. Like almost all fishermen on Cape Cod, I depend almost entirely on codfish for my living. In recent years, we've turned to less traditional species due to the decline of the codfish stock. In the early 60s, we had these big foreign fleets, primarily from Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc, and from Asia come with very high technology fishing boats that, like we hadn't seen here. These were big factory trawlers, dragging huge nets behind them and pretty much sweeping up everything in their paths. And the stocks dropped. In 1976, the federal government removed foreign fishing interests from our federal waters out to 200 miles. And when they did this, they wanted to model their own fishing fleet after what they had forced out. The old uh, antiquated fleet that we had here changed almost overnight to much more modern technology. So the ability of the fishermen to basically target fish was uh, much improved. And so really, the fish don't have much of a chance. When you think about what's happened to the codfish resource off of our shores, there's three main components to it. Habitat degradation, bycatch, and overfishing. Habitat degradation has been occurring mainly due to dragging. Draggers drag a large net across the bottom, disturbing the seafloor. And there's very serious concern that uh, overuse of those gears rips up the uh, habitat quality that young fish need to successfully reproduce and grow. And so we're starting to look at things like closed areas as places where we can monitor habitat quality and see if that actually improves the survivorship of fish. Additionally, bycatch is a severe problem. Bycatch is when you're fishing for codfish or another species and you catch unwanted fish that are discarded dead or dying. I think that most fishermen realize that uh, we've overfished our stocks and we've taken too much and that Mother Nature can't keep up with the rate of harvest that, that we've utilized. Woods Hole, Massachusetts is a world leader in marine and environmental science research. Here you'll find the National Marine Fisheries Service, which maintains the oldest fisheries research laboratory in the world. It's the job of the National Marine Fisheries Service to manage U.S. fish stocks to help bring their numbers up. But management becomes very complicated. In a commons like the ocean, there are various stakeholders with different needs. In this country, wildlife laws very strongly reflected the idea that um, the environment and nature should be open to everybody. At the same time, there is also a strong belief that nature should be open to business enterprises. And that means that nature open to all is fragile, or can be fragile if there aren't other rules. And so what happened is a lot of what looks like open access is actually regulated by different rules. Basically, when we leave the docks, we have prescribed regulations about how many days we can fish each year, where we can fish, how much fish we can take. You know, it seems like they're trying to strangle off our livelihood. Sometimes fishermen will disagree with scientists um, over whether a stock is actually threatened or not. But even when they agree that a stock is threatened, they might disagree over the kind of management measures that have been implemented. And the reason for this is, or one reason, is that not all fishermen are the same. It makes a lot of sense to conserve these stocks, to build them up, and to allow stable catches over time. We'd like to see the stocks rebuild to some of their former sizes, and we'd like to see a much more healthy resource and much more healthy fishery in the future. 
gray whales were very nearly hunted into extinction by people who wanted their oil, bones, and even their blubber. But thanks to many nations volunteering to stop whaling, the gray whale is no longer on the endangered species list. There are about a million alligators in wetland habitats throughout the state of Louisiana. Approximately 25,000 of them are here at Rockefeller Refuge. Almost everywhere you look, you see a gator, but it hasn't always been that way. During the 40s, 50s, early part of the century, uh, alligators were uh, overhunted or overharvested, as we say, to where their numbers became somewhat lower than they should be, uh, perhaps not endangered, but it was cause for concern. And this is when the state banned hunting and placed uh, strict management goals. And that was when the population gradually came back. The alligator was a very important part of the wetlands ecosystem. It's a strong incentive for land managers to preserve their wetlands if they can maintain an alligator population to where they can harvest some adult alligators. This is an incentive for owners to preserve their wetlands, which benefits other species. The Department of Wildlife and Fisheries has a regulated alligator harvest in the fall of each year. The reason they do this is to harvest the surplus adults in the population. They determine the number of tags that each trapper is allowed to use based on how much land that person owns and how many gators are believed to be on his land. So wildlife and fisheries determines the number of alligators they're allowed to take. Our population is still actively rising at this point. It presents us with a lot of opportunities to do different research projects and just study different facets of the alligator population that we have. And I think this is something that uh, we should be able to continue to do for many years in the future. Alligators have about 80 teeth at one time. When they wear down, they are replaced, and an alligator can go through 2,000 to 3,000 in a lifetime. Holy mackerel! Sometimes a commons can be threatened while people are trying to accomplish something else. This is the Gulf of Mexico, where hundreds of families earn their living fishing the shrimp, which are a commons in these waters. But in the same water, another commons, the Ridley Sea Turtle is struggling to survive. Some shrimpers use nets, which were great at catching shrimp, but they also unintentionally caught the Ridley sea turtle, and many of them died. The federal government ordered that a mechanism had to be installed on all shrimp nets, which lets the turtles escape. In this case, it was a device people used to fish that unintentionally threatened to deplete a resource. Here's a tackle box brain teaser for you. Say you're a wildlife agent, and you're in charge of protecting the fish in a lake. You hear that a guy has invented a really effective fishing lure. So powerful is the lure that fish are literally jumping out of the water and into the boat. How can you stop the destruction of this commons? Think about that. We'll tackle the answer a little later. Nations have been fighting for years over who owned the fish in the sea. They've been fighting over whether boats from other countries should be allowed to fish along foreign coasts. In 1982, the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention decided there would be no more international fighting over fish and so-called exclusive economic zones were established, extending out 200 miles from each nation's coast. Fish can swim anywhere they want to, but now fishermen are mindful of extended national boundaries in the water. This means they have to obey the rules of other countries. What to do about the guy in his fish catching gizmo? Well, consider what real wildlife agents do. They can limit the number of fish he can catch, they can limit the types of fishing equipment he can use, including that gizmo, and they can also limit fishing to certain times of the year instead of all year long. Here's the commons that may not be obvious to you. Businesses wanting to advertise to travelers try to put up so many billboards that several states have passed laws to limit the number and size of billboards along a scenic highway. What is the commons in that situation? What is the thing that everyone owns? The scenery. These inner city Chicago students call themselves the River Rats. Their club has completely transformed this area along the Bubbly Creek near the Chicago River. It was once a common place to dump junk, but the River Rats have cleaned up the trash, created trails, and helped bring wildlife back into the area. It's now a great commons area for people in Chicago to experience nature. Sometimes people don't agree on what is a commons and what is private property. For instance, from America, let's head south to Antarctica, one of the most unspoiled places left on Earth. When explorers first stepped foot on the Earth's icy south continent in the 1830s, people wondered, would it be a finder's keepers thing? An international treaty set up how the southernmost continent could be shared. 
also with limits being set for depleting the resources and degradation of the environment. When NASA sent the robot probe Sojourner to Mars, it rolled around on the planet taking pictures and conducting tests. Meanwhile, two businessmen in the Middle East tried to grab ownership of the entire planet of Mars. They drew up a deed with their names on it. The world laughed at them. Mars is a commons, at least for now. International space agencies realized no one particular country could own space. So they agreed to build a space station together and all share studying the new information collected out there, which was a commons for all nations. Besides, building the station was so expensive, it made sense to share the costs of building it. Whatever you decide to designate as a commons, it must be thought of in the long term. Yeah, the big picture. See, the present as a lot longer than just today. The present could be something like 200 years. And the future represents not just the rest of your life and your children's lives, but generation after generation of your family. The city of Boston, Massachusetts, has always been known for the important role it played in U.S. history. This is where the Boston Massacre happened in 1770, and where three years later, the Boston Tea Party took place. Both events had helped lead to the Revolutionary War with Great Britain. But over a hundred years before these startling events came to pass, Boston had already created something that would symbolize the freedoms and unity of the soon-to-be independent country of America. They called it the Boston Common. Boston Common, which is here behind us, uh, is designated as the oldest park in the United States, and it was got that in 1634. Now, the Puritans came in 1630, and it was used as a common area to graze their sheep and their cattle. And pretty much the reason is it was tradition. Uh, when they came from England, the area was very crowded over there, so they generally set aside major areas for everyone to use. The Boston Common was also used for events such as political speeches, protests, and celebrations. It became the heart of the city. Today, uses in the common, the Boston Common is a major focal point for the city of Boston, for the residents. The people that live here use this as their backyard. They come here to uh, run their dogs. Uh, they come here to watch concerts. They come here to enjoy the scenery and get away from the hustle and the bustle of the city itself. So it's really important for the city of Boston to have all of this green space to use on an everyday basis. Anybody who wants to have an event this is a public park and a public area, and it's owned by everyone. It's important not only just for the people to come and enjoy, but also for the amount of wildlife that lives here because of the green space. It's important to preserve areas like the Boston Common to conserve this area. It, it is a natural resource, and it's one of those things that could go away if we weren't here to protect it. And that's how the idea of a common area was started here in America. And how it's been adapted to fit into the 20th century needs of this modern city. So you've seen my favorite fishing hole. Take a look at the commons that are around you. They could be important signs of who you are and what you think is important. Well, that's it for the show. See you next time. Hey, I caught one. Doggone it. I think it's a size 11. Place named for its a, a place named for its once abundant cod for which would cut down the number of fish he catches. Gotta get there, gotta get there, gotta get there. In the fishery, we've seen the. Actually, it's a fish made for it. Just passing through, guys. And and how it's been adapted to fit into the. I think I love you. I'm out of here.